A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. You will hear part of a consultation between a psychologist and a patient called Mr. Barry. Hi there, Mr. Barry. Your GP has referred you to me to discuss your anxiety. So tell me, how have you been feeling? Well, I'm still suffering from the anxiety and panic attacks and the medication that I'm taking. I found that it seems to have some side effects and it makes me still feel a little on edge. So I found it better to take the medication at night rather than in the morning and so I can get on with the day kind of thing, but I still feel quite anxious. Okay. Getting used to the medications can be difficult. Going back, when did you start the treatment again? Oh, uh, what, three weeks ago now? And that was the citalopram, the one to hopefully control the panic symptoms longer term, and the chlordiazepoxide, which is for the more short-term control. How many of the chlordiazepoxide are you using a day at the moment? Well, the doctor gave me 20 milligrams three times a day, but to be honest, I'm trying to cut them out. I only use them if I really, really need them. Good. And do you feel okay with that? Yeah, it's like I don't feel like they suppress me enough, if you get what I mean. I know that my main aim to tackle this is, to be honest, is getting fit and more exercise, because I know that's the feeling that I need to aim towards. Because I know from past experience that when I work out, I feel better, I feel more relaxed, etc. So I'm trying to work towards that. So, how many actually are you having at the moment? Uh, today, I've had to go into work just for a conference with my manager, you know, just to discuss how things are going and stuff. So, I had to take two because I just felt like I couldn't manage it otherwise. Right, okay. So, over the past four or five days? Uh, none, except for the two today. So, you've actually been laying off them altogether? Yeah, I've been trying, and when I do take them, I don't... I only feel suppressed for a very short amount of time. Right. Now, the citalopram medication... Yes, I'm on 20 milligrams once a day, and the side effects headaches were quite bad to begin with, and I'm still getting them, but I think that could be more stress-related, because they're not very... I wouldn't call them painful headaches. I just can feel they're there. I also had a sore ear, so I wondered if I might just have an infection or something too. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, but you're now taking the citalopram at night. Yeah, I found that if I take it first thing when I get up, I still feel quite edgy, and also the side effects. Yes, okay, right. Now, the reason you started the treatment was because you were getting full-blown panic attacks. Can you tell me a bit more about the attacks? Yeah, well, I couldn't leave the house. My heart races, and I really struggle to breathe, and I just feel an intense fear. It makes me feel sick and dizzy if I go out into the street. You find it very difficult to get out and about. Are you beginning to normalize, do you think? Yes, I've managed. I've got, I went over to the soup store on my own and I managed. I felt a bit, a bit jittery at first, but you know, I've learned over the years after suffering quite severely with them years ago that you just have to take your mind to a different place. And you know, I just concentrated on what I wanted from the shop. That was the first time I've been out on my own since I started on the medication. Extract two questions 13 to 24. You will hear part of a consultation between a GP and a patient called Mr. Martin. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with word or a short phrase.
Hello, Mr. Martin. I'm Dr. Hampton. Hello. Nice to meet you. And you.、Uh, how can I help you?、Uh, well, I've come about my stomach. I've had problems with it over the years, on and off, but at the moment it seems to be worse again.、Uh, mainly, kind of just real sore feelings across here.、Mm, okay.、Um, when you get the pain, where is it exactly? Can you show me? Yes, it's, it's here. It's sort of across the upper part of the tummy and down here to the middle of the tummy. Uh huh. And how would you describe the pain? Could you put words to it? It's more sore. I can't say it's a real pain. It's more a sore feeling and like irritation, maybe? Right.、Um, does it move around or, or is it always in the same place? Yeah, I, I mean, sometimes. It always seems to start here in the middle, kind of. I can feel a bit there now, but. I've, got, I've had it more down each side as well, and I didn't know. At one point, I wondered whether it was my kidneys or something, or whether it's still the same thing. I don't know. Okay. And you said it's both sides. Do you mean together, or does it sort of flip from one side to the other? Yeah, not together. It goes from one side to the other. So it really moves around this pain, doesn't it?、Um, do you get bloated when you get the pain? Yes, very bloated. And can you tell me how long this has been happening? Well, I first had it several years ago. I had it when I was working, and a, a doctor I went to see said then it was probably irritable bowel. That was four years ago. Right. Was the bloating a part of that too? Yes. And did things settle down for a period of time? Yeah, they settled down when I was watching my diet much more. And when obviously I wasn't as stressed, I'd given up work. Okay. What about your bowels? Can they be a bit variable? Yes, very much so. Could you tell me a bit more about that?、Um, well, I've always had a bit of a problem with constipation, mainly. But I mean, I'm going just, just recently going perhaps a couple of days and not really going. And then, like in the last couple of days, every time I eat, I seem to want to go. Right. And, and are you getting loose motions? It's loose, yes. Right, okay. Yeah, I mean, really, nothing has changed. I mean, I, I drink loads of water, but when I'm constipated, it's really hard and just like, you know,、uh, like small brown pieces when I go. And then when it's loose, it's a bit ribbony. I've always had a bit of a ribbony movement. Yes. Is it true diarrhea or, or not?、Mm, no. No, okay. Um. Have you passed anything unusual looking? Any blood or slime or anything strange? No, I haven't. Haven't passed black motions as far as you know? No. Um, when you had the IBS before, what sort of things did you do for it? Um, I think, I think Dr. Dorsey gave me some Colifac, is it? Or something like that? Yes, that sounds right. Was that helpful? Uh, kind of. Because she explained to me about a kind of a spasm thing.、Um, but I, I just kind of watched what I ate again. I mean, you know, it's probably worse if I don't go to the toilet. And so, you know, I try to eat things and, you know, to make sure I do go without taking anything, you know, without any laxatives of any description. And then I know it's probably really old fashioned, but I take peppermint oil, you know, the capsules. And I think they're actually really helpful. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a doctor and a trainee discussing the application of a plaster cast. So let's discuss the short arm cast that you're going to apply. What are the steps? Well, first, I need to examine the area and check the x rays to see if surgery is needed. For the cast, first, I'll apply a stockinette with a hole for the thumb, and then I'll wrap the arm in a web drill for padding. After that, I need to immerse the roll of plaster in water. Right. 
And what should you point out about the plaster? I need to warn the patient that it may feel hot as it starts to set. How long does it take to dry? The cast may feel dry to the touch in a few minutes, but it isn't fully dry for 72 hours. What's the last step? After I've applied the cast, I need to take another x-ray to confirm that the fracture has been reduced. You hear a manager explaining new data management processes to clinical staff. Yes, in the back. You had a question? Yes. Uh, how should we file our feedback reports? Do we need to just complete them on the computer? That's a great question. Remember that since the clinic has begun transitioning to the new computers and software systems, we need you to fill out the paper reports in addition to the digital versions. I know this may be time consuming, but this is because as we transfer all our files from the old servers to the new ones, some files may be misplaced, and we want to ensure that all of our records are easily accessible at all times. So we need to make two copies of our reports? Yes, exactly. Great. Does anyone else have a question? You hear a presentation about the introduction of a new type of wound dressing. Thank you all for coming. Well, after some research, the hospital has decided to invest in a new type of dressing to care for our patients with chronic wounds, such as those with diabetic ulcers. Although the traditional cloth compression bandages are useful, they need to be changed frequently to promote healing. These new bandages are made of a natural, plant-based material instead. In fact, they're made from seaweed. Alginate dressings are somewhat costly, but they can prevent harmful strains of bacteria from entering the wound by forming a protective barrier with the skin. Most impressive of all, they can absorb up to 20 times their own weight, so they're the best choice for wounds with high-level exudate. Based on these factors, we believe that alginate dressing would be a useful addition to our wound care procedures. You hear two hospital managers discussing completion rates for an online course. It looks like only around 40% of the staff have completed the online health and safety course so far. Less than half, but the course has to be completed by all staff members by the end of the month. Can we send them a reminder email? We've reminded them by email twice already. I've even phoned a few people. I think we need to bring it up at the general staff meeting next week. That's on Thursday afternoon, right? Will that work with everyone's schedules? It should. All staff members have that time already blocked out. But if anyone can't come, then we can speak to them in person one-on-one. -on -one. You hear an educator describing methods for creating medical abbreviations to nursing trainees. A technical name for the use of first letters is initialing, but I prefer to use the phrase the first letter rule for this method. Abbreviations using the first letter rule commonly identify diseases and diagnostic tests. For example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is COPD, or liver function tests are LFTs. In most cases, these letters are pronounced separately as letters, but sometimes key letters or key syllables form the abbreviation. For example, hypertension is abbreviated using HTN, or we see the term atrial fibrillation abbreviated as either AF or AFib. Sometimes the first letters form an easily pronounceable word, an acronym. For example, acquired immune deficiency syndrome becomes AIDS, or severe acute respiratory syndrome becomes SARS. Understanding these principles will help you to more quickly learn the many abbreviations used in local clinical settings. You hear two colleagues discussing an online training course. Hi Fiona, how are you? Can I ask you something? Sure, Mark. What's up? Have you done that online training for a new record management process? Yeah, I did it on the weekend. It was supposed to take 10 minutes, but it took me ages. Did you have any trouble with it? I mean, any technical problems? Not really. I couldn't log in for a bit, but that was just me getting my password wrong. After that, it worked fine. Why? I keep 
getting this email that says, I haven't finished all the activities. And then when I log in, it says I've completed everything. It's driving me crazy. Did you ring the IT help guys? Yeah, they reset it, but it didn't do anything. I really don't want to do it again. Mm, no, you shouldn't have to. Maybe just send the register an email and let her know that you've done it. Maybe she can fix the issue. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract. I wrote a prescription for antibiotics. Okay. Um, I did want to talk to you, though. I'm a little bit concerned looking through his chart at how many ear infections he's had recently. And I, I noticed that you had checked the box that someone's smoking in the home. So I was wondering if you can tell me a little more about that. Well, um, it's just me and him, and I do smoke. Um, I try really hard not to smoke around him. But I... I've been smoking for 10 years, except when I was pregnant with him, but it, everything is so stressful being a single mom and, and my having a full-time job, and so it's just, that's why I started smoking again. You have a lot of things going on, and smoking's kind of a way to relax and de-stress. Yes. Yeah. Some people have a glass of wine, I have a cigarette. <laughs> sure. And it sounds like you're trying not to smoke around him. Why did you make that decision? I know it's not good for him. I mean, I've read those things about ear infections and asthma and stuff. and and uh, But other kids have ear infections, and their parents don't smoke. So on the one hand, you're worried about how your smoking might be affecting him. And on the other hand, you're not so sure if it's really the smoking that's causing these problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have asthma. Yeah, I don't... He hasn't had a lot of other problems that his other friends have. So, and I've thought about quitting before in the past, but I just don't. I just don't see how it's possible right now. What made you decide to quit smoking when you were pregnant? Well, he was inside me, and we were sharing everything, and I knew that he would get some of that, and I didn't. I just didn't didn't think I could live with myself if something happened to him. Right now, though, it feels almost too difficult to even manage or even to try. Yeah, exactly. How were you successful when you quit before? I don't know. I, I think about it now. I don't even know how I did it. I just, I just did it. You know, I just, I just couldn't imagine, like, him not being born or going into labor early mm -hmm. and, and him having problems and stuff like that, all the stuff that they talk about with women who smoke. So I, that was just enough to, to say, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to risk that. Mm -hmm. So The risks were so scary then that you were able to stop. But yeah. They don't feel as scary to you now. No, I mean, we're two separate people. And like I said, I, don't, I try really hard not to smoke around him. I'm pretty good about that. I, I don't let other people smoke around him. Um, so I, you know... You're doing the best you can do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds to me, too, like part of you really does want to quit. Yeah, I, I, I know that I need to, and I, you know, keep 
every new year I say, okay, this year I'm going to quit smoking. But then something happens and it it just doesn't. It's on your to-do list. It's just not making it to the top. Yeah. If you did decide to quit, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not at all confident, you don't think you could do it, and 10 is you feel pretty certain that you could, where do you think you fall right now? Probably like a 5 kind of in the unsure area mm -hmm. like I know I've done it before so I know I can do it but at the same time it just seems really hard and it's sure. not the same situation well what made you say five rather than two or three I know I know all the ways it's bad for me and I don't want him to grow up thinking that it's okay to smoke I don't want him to to use any kind of I don't want him to chew or, or anything like that um, so I know I need to, especially before he gets old enough to understand mm -hmm. what mommy's doing, but I just don't know if I can do it. Okay. So it sounds like you have a lot of reasons why you'd like to quit. You have been successful quitting in the past, and right now you're just feeling a little bit hesitant about your ability to do it. Yeah. Where do you think we should go from here? I don't know. I, I'd like some help. I just don't know what kind of help I need. Sure. So. Well, if you'd be interested, that's something I can definitely talk to you about. There are a lot of new options that can actually help people be way more successful in their attempt at quitting. There's different medications you can try. I don't like medicine. Okay. There's also a lot of support groups and classes that you can take where you have other people to go through it with you, and sometimes just having that support can be a big part of it, especially for people like you where smoking is such a stress reliever. That sounds nice, but I'm not sure if I have the time for all that. Sure, it feels like something that would take up a lot of time and maybe not fit into your life. I wonder if we could talk about some options that might fit into your life. That would be really nice. Okay, well, if you're willing, then we could set up another appointment where you could come in and we could talk more about that. I would like that. That would be great. Great. Thank you. Sure. Here on the Health Report, we cover all sorts of search. The Mediterranean diet, what fat is right for you, how much salt is safe, diets to protect you from diabetes, early death, heart disease. So this next segment is actually a bit perturbing. We're being told that almost all this research is wrong. Yes, John Unidas is Professor of Medicine at Stanford University, and he says the scientific approach taken by nutritional researchers is nowhere near rigorous enough, and we have to go back to basics if we're to learn anything significant about how diets impact health. Thank you for inviting me. Now, we've had you on lots of times before, talking about various things and uh, demolishing a few iconic areas of health and research. You're arguing that nutritional research needs radical reform. On what basis do you say that? Well, th there's clearly a factory of papers being produced in uh, nutrition uh, epidemiology in particular that don't meet very high standards of credibility. The type of research that is being done in nutritional epidemiology, it's not an issue that there's bad scientists involved in it. You know, maybe excellent scientists are involved in it, but the odds of getting it right are extremely small. Let's look at that in a moment, but you quote in your paper some really bizarre conclusions that you might come to from, uh, if you have believed, past nutritional research. Do you want to just tell us some of those bizarre findings in the, the relation to either longevity or shortened lifespan? Most of these studies are not experimental. They're not randomized. They're just uh, observing people who report what they eat and they take that seriously that this is reflecting exactly what they ate, which is one major assumption. Second, people take these behaviors and these numbers as causal, which means that they look at the numbers and they translate them to an effect of these nutrients or of these foods on mortality. And then they also make a another assumption that uh, these risks are applicable to the entire lifespan. So then uh, let's take a number like 15% uh, relative risk reduction in mortality or 15% increase in survival which is a typical number that comes out of these studies. And this is uh, the number that is the summary of all the data, for example, on what is the benefit with eating 12 hazelnuts a day. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if you translate that to a game in uh, survival, you take 80 years, you multiply that by 15%. This looks like a 12-year gain in survival just by eating 12 hazelnuts a day. Or, or literally, one hazelnut a day would give you one more year of life uh, as a benefit. It's a ridiculous calculation. It is not so, of course. Even if you believe that one of these foods or one of these nutrients or a couple of them may be important, it's impossible to believe that every single food, every single nutrient will have such tremendous benefits or such tremendous risks. So you, you get there because of there's multiple levels of unreliability. Is that what it is? That essentially the food diary is unreliable, they're not controlling for other factors such as education and other environmental factors properly and they all conflate together to give you bizarre results? Is that what's going on? Exactly. It's a, it's a problem at multiple levels. It's an extremely difficult field to study. And it doesn't mean that observational studies, that epidemiological studies, get it wrong all the time. In many other fields, the problems are much more straightforward. For example, we know for sure that smoking is killing zillions of people. It will kill one billion people in the next century unless we do something. But the, the effect uh, of smoking is huge. Uh, the, the risk increases 20-fold if uh, someone is smoking for getting lung cancer. But just to challenge you on that, whilst we're confident in smoking, why are we confident in smoking and not in coffee? Because there have been no randomized controlled trials of getting people to smoke and other people not to smoke. I mean, so that's still on observational studies, is it not? The major difference with smoking is that the, uh, the effect is tremendous. Uh, we're talking, as I said, of a 20-fold increase in risk of lung cancer, 10-fold increase in cardiovascular disease, and many other diseases have tremendous increase in risk. For each single nutrient, each single uh, thing that we eat or drink, the effects, even if you take these studies literally, are much, much, much smaller. And based on what we know from some randomized trials that we have done, the effects are pretty much close to no, if not exactly no. I mean, it's very likely that they're exactly no, which means that it's a complete waste to even try to pursue them any further. What about we cannot really use epidemiology to study a relative risk of 1.01. .01. We can do it to study a relative risk of 20, which is what's the case for smoking. And just to dissect that out for a non, people don't know the statistics, is that 1.01 .01 is, there's no effect, 1.01 .01 is just tiny, whereas 20, an effect of 20 is 20 times the risk. So 1.01 .01 right. .01 is just a little bit over what would be normal and probably within normal limits. So uh, what about eating patterns? I mean, you yourself have been involved in trials of the Mediterranean diet. So I think that eating patterns in theory might be able to get you a little bit of that complexity of all these nutrients interacting together. But even those are very difficult, if not impossible, to study within an observational context. Again, you have most of these problems operating. Number one, you need to ask people what type of eating pattern they're following, and you know responses may be accurate or very often may be very inaccurate, especially if you try to recall what you ate and tell what you're doing, just try it to yourself and, <laughs> and, and see whether that information would be reliable. The second problem is that you still have extreme complexity among all these nutrients. We, we have over 200,000 different foods that you can combine in different ways. There's no clear eating pattern that each one of us is following. We follow different eating patterns in different periods of our lives and different days even. And it also changes all the time. If you superimpose the way that we react to all of these uh, chemicals that we digest, our metabolic profile, also our genetic profile might affect how we react. Circumstances, uh, our environment, socioeconomic factors that dictate what we decide to eat or not eat and what we do or don't do with our life at the same time, it's an extremely complex system.